Hello, welcome to another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace, reporting live here at Chelsea Table and Stage here in New York City. As you know, one of my key missions here on the Pace Report is to continue to expose as well as introduce musicians from all over the world who are carrying the rich tradition of American black music by way of their nationalities as well as their culture from all over the world. And tonight here on The Pace Report, performing live here at Chelsea Table and Stage, is a dynamic Cuban-born pianist by the name of Di Rubier Gonzalez, who not only studied the rich European vein of classical music, but he came here to the United States and studied at the famed Berklee School of Music under the tutelage of a scholarship, but also was mentored by heavyweights. I'm talking about guys like Joanne Brackeen as well as the legendary Danilo Perez. Tonight, he's performing some music off his brand new album, Tribute to Juan Fromel and Los Van Van, here tonight here at Chelsea Table and Stage. And I had a chance to sit down to break bread with him to talk about one, why Juan Fromel and Los Van Van is very important to not only Cuban music, but he establishes them as, or hails them as, like the Rolling Stones of his native Cuba. But also we sit down and we talk about his formation as a piano player, how classical played into how he developed into a first class jazz pianist, as well as reflect on how he was mentored by the great Danilo Perez, as well as Joanne Brackeen, as well as talk about and reflect on one of his other mentors, the legendary Chucho Valdez. So sit back, relax, and enjoy highlights of Di Ramirez Gonzalez, live performing here at Chelsea Table and Stage.
CD, mm. tribute to Juan Fromel and Los Van Van. Now, the other night I watched the behind the scenes in the documentary on why this is very important to you and everybody who's from Cuba because this gentleman was pretty much the big, big guy musically. Why did you decide to do his music some 20 years later in a tribute for him? I would say that, uh, you know, Juan Fromel is one of, you know, after, after the, the Cuban Revolution took place in 1960, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, Cuba in somehow isolate themselves a little bit away from the world you know, because of the, all the political thing that went around it. And in Cuban, in Cuban music, after the 1960s, we have two figures that really make a very strong mark. One is Chucho Valdez in the Afro-Cuban jazz, and then we have Juan Formel in the other side, in the, in the Cuban popular music. And Juan Formel is one of the, of the leaders who actually created a mark in bringing drum set into popular salsa type of music, bringing trombones, bringing electric guitar, bringing a lot of sound that uh, it wasn't really, really into the music that we were used to listen to it before. Because we can say that uh, in New York City, we have uh, the, the salsa movement in New York, right? And, uh, but uh, the salsa movement didn't have drum set and all of those instruments. So in somehow inside the, 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 the cooking, the musical cooking that we were having in Cuba, the conversation that we have in Cuba from the 60s, 1960s and on, Juan Fromel really had a, like a very strong influence on us, the young generation. So for me, it was like a, one of the biggest challenges of my career to actually approach his music because you know if you guys are familiar with Juan Fumero Juan Bang, it's a band that is very established. Number two, the sound is so strong. They call it El Tren de, la, El Tren de Cuba. It's a machine of music. It's a machine of, of, of force that I saw so amazing in a way that uh, it's intimidating to approach it. So I said that uh, the only way I can successfully try to get away from the bambaneros who are used to this type of music is just completely to go in another direction and approach it from the, the composer and the orchestrator. This is what really put me in a safe place that I said, okay, this is my vision about one for Melos Mumbai. Now, when you did this, did you reach out to the Fromel, the family, the estate, and how did they respond to you, one, piquing an interest in recording his music and revisioning the music, because this is all a revision of, of, of all his songs, and what was their response after they heard the music? Well, before before they heard it, I will say that you know I told them I wanna do this tribute for your band, for, for your for your papa and for the band and it's for the fifth anniversary of Los Bamban opening the Havana Jazz Festival. And uh, they say okay, um, but uh, you know that uh, you have to really take care of the music very well, right? And he said, listen, I have the responsibility. The only thing I know that I wanna put the, uh, like a, my own mark as a composer into it. So he said, okay, they were a little bit skeptical. <laughs> I saw their faces, but uh, the good thing about it like you know when the album actually came out the project they were I would say that they were a you know a sinful in a way that I took the risk to not to stay in you know within the four walls that are when you hear a version of Love and Band most of the time people really follow the same arrangement, the same form of the original song. So when I just broke it down and, and create my own stuff in a way that they say, you know what, I believe that Juan Formel, uh, he really would be happy to have heard this because he was a revolutionary musical wise. He was a, he had like an artist who, who had like a big musical democracy in a way, meaning that uh, he wanted to have the young generation to push the music forward, to be able to not to be scared of, 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 of really like saying before music was there, now this is something new. Songo with Los Bam Bam was this in the 70s, now this is something new. So I'm a Cubano, I'm a black Cubano living in New York City with a lot of influence from Duke Ellington, from Billy Strayhorn, from McCoy Tyner, from uh, Chick Corea, from Herbie Hancock, as well from Chucho Valdez from Juan Fermel himself, and then when you put all of that from Juan Sebastian Bach, when you put all of that together, 
I will actually, you know, I will put my my own voice. This is this is what I really wanted, just to tell the world that this is my vision of how Dynamite Gonzalez approaches one for minus music. You know, it's very interesting. We, we talked we talked the other night about how musical styles, you know, Brazilian, Afro-Cuban, um, African, and all the rhythms that, that Cuba, <laughs> Cuba represents, it's really a reflection of, of Africa. And I want you to tell my viewers how, as a pianist, because you guys have a whole lineage of great Cuban piano players. Mm -hmm. You guys come from a very percussive background. Why is that? I would say because one of the biggest blessings, the biggest blessings that we have in Cuba is that we carry, we still carry um, very alive, pretty much very alive, the legacy of the Yoruba, the Yoruba tribe who came from West Africa, Benin, Congo, Nigeria. When they came, in the in the you know the the Atlantic slave trade to Cuba, they really go to Cuba and they were able to to find a way to to establish themselves. But one of the things that we were able to keep was the tambor. So the drumming was coming for years of years generation where that had been the only way for us before we have a piano we have the tambor to, to express how happy we feel how sad we feel even through the tambor because we have in la rumba we have jambu the jambu is more like a slow down you see the you know the cryness you see the the type of you know the frustration of that person you know you, you see all of that in the body and also through the tambour and then when you see that uh, you are able to communicate that much through this drumming then the easiest part is just to put it here. <laughs> right, right. The easiest part is just to take that and put it here because you know, as I said, you know, I mean, I mean, I'm a percussionist who plays piano. You know, I'm a percussionist who had the blessing to understand harmonies, to understand, you know, to have control of, of the craft. That's the craft, the craft part, right? But uh, I think first on. So it's very percussive through the lens of harmony and scales and stuff. All of that is craft inside the, the, the feeling. You know, we have to pay homage to the great Chano Pozo because without him, you know, Dizzy Gillespie probably would never have emulated or even try to study some of the origins of our native rhythms by way of Cuba. Would you would you say that's very responsible for that? I mean definitely Chano Pozo was the most famous uh, figure that uh, with this epic great the Cuba but I remember for even before Chano Pozo in the 30s we have Arsenio Rodriguez the creator of Somontuno who was coming back and forth to New York 
Havana, New York and Havana. So that trade was even coming very earlier than that a channel also era. So uh, he's one of those creators because it was a perfect, beautiful connection between him and with the Bebop of DC. Uh, but it's definitely among many, 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 but a pro to him. I'm saying like proto channel also because definitely definitely he's like a one, one of the ones who created that a uh, connection you know connection. We, we we talked about um growing up because you just said you know you didn't start off playing piano you you started off as a percussion player but I know that a lot of your contemporaries who I've interviewed from 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 Cuba um, their their heavy roots are in classical music Tell me how classical has transformed you as a piano player and tell me the importance of classical in you transitioning into jazz. Man, this is a beautiful question. I always say that, I, you know, you see my manners, you see, you know, I always say my manners in a way that is coming from classical music. Classical music, first of all, I'm coming from the hood of Havana, the super very hood of Havana. It's called El Cerro. If you are in New York, that would be Harlem, or that would be the, the Bronx. If you are in LA, that would be, I don't know, that, you know, the what? Hanson, exactly. What? That would be Little Miami, Little Haiti in Miami. You know, I'm coming from the hood where many of the majority of my friends, they were in jail or back and forth. So, surviving musical wise and being able to express myself in a positive, positive way in that environment was kind of quite difficult, right? But I will say that I'm in Cuba we have the opportunity, the blessing, that our system create a, you know, a musical school for little kids. So when you are six, seven years old, uh, depending on of your neighborhood, your parents take you to the school and uh, you do the audition, if you are accepted, you start a very rigid, classical European Cuban school of, of, of music. So Bach, Beethoven, listening, critical listening to Baroque music, critical listening to, to Romanticism, understanding what make one, one uh, genre different from the other one, all of that really shaped me in a way that now when I approach piano, the sensibility, first of all, the sensibility of creating lines that's, that's definitely coming from classical music. When I, when I approach the piano, all, the, all my polyphonic contrapuntal way of seeing the harmony is coming from back from classical music. My left hand, most of the time, sometimes when you see jazz players, this guy, the right hand is fire, but I hear it mostly just chords. But and then with, through musical, classical music, I was able to now to approach uh, the piano as an orchestral thing. So when I see the piano, I see that I'm a, I'm a, I'm a percussion guy, I'm a jazz, I'm, I'm a, a contrapuntal, I'm a, I'm a melodic wise guy, I'm a, I'm a harmonic guy. So in, in, a, in a way, that gave me a type of control of this monster instrument. It's a monster. <laughs> but he loves me, I love him. Sometimes I hate him. He hates me. <laughs> he hates me back. It's like, a, you know, but it has been a journey of emotion. You know, my, my parents went through a lot of, let's say, through a divorce that was very hard for us. And um, I remember, you know, my brother and I really going through a lot of things. But um, I, I can say that uh, literally music and the piano saved me because I used to spend six, seven, eight hours practicing in the piano because for me that was like in those four by four wall sitting sitting in front of the piano is like a, I have control of this environment outside there is chaos outside but I just right here in this so if you know when you know that you are in a comfort zone that you don't want to let it, let it go for, for uh, never so this is how the way I felt when I was sitting in the piano I know that I, the minute I close the the how you call it the lid or yeah. the little the little the piano. I can control my parents, my the, the environment, the you know the neighborhood, the thing. But when I'm do this, I feel artist. I feel like I have control of my own dreams, of my own future.
protege of one of <laughs> Cuba's greatest living pianist, Chucho Valdez. Now, from my understanding, your relationship with Chucho goes by way of your father, because your father's a musician and they go back quite a bit. Explain your relationship with him. Well, Chucho Valdez, first of all, it doesn't really come through my father. Uh, my, fa my father was a trumpet player, my father was someone that, uh, that uh, really put me in the hands of, of a lot of, to expose me to a lot of music, a lot of music, but uh, the connection with Chucho came when uh, a 16, 17 years old, I, I started like uh, having more attention, like winning contests, classical contests in Cuba, piano-wise, and he was used to, used to come to the school to visit the new coming, you know, cab that we're having, no, right? So we used to play for them, for Chucho when he was coming to, so at that time, it just, just, I admire you, you know, lovely. Then when I grew up, I was simple enough to do a tour with him, Diego Sigala and Beo Valdez in, in Spain. And uh, that, in that concert, in that tour, we did a concert that is called Piano in Three Generations. Chucho, Bebo, and I, 2007. So that concert really embraced the relationship of me and Chucho, me and Bebo, to really like, you know, we were more, more closer together. Then when I came back to Havana, a few months after, he actually had an invitation waiting for me in Havana that uh, he selected three young piano musicians, piano, piano players, to do a tribute to the French composer Tete Montolieu, piano player. In, in Havana Jazz Festival. So one of those, so from there, it has been a connection uh, every year from there. So then, when I was pre-selected to, to enter to Berklee College of Music, I called Chucho himself and I said, Maestro, I need to put some time aside because I would like to hear the pieces I'm, that I'm going to prepare for my audition to Berklee. So I had, I had a, a, you know, a blues, I had a jazz standard, but I also had some composition of mine that Chucho was there, you know, listened to a few of them. I said, look, this one is the strongest one, it's the most complete one. It has a, you know, a nice background of, of, of let's say, contra danza, danza, danzón, jazz, stuff here more percussive this one is more complete what what don't you like so he he, he told me something that I, you know it was very remarkable in the in the later on in the exam and the audition because you know uh, he used to have the independency of having clave here in the left hand and in the right hand in a I was so mind blowing every time I saw Chucho was just doing that and he told me if you practice this you will get <laughs> you will get them and I did and I honestly I did it was like you know I did my bebop stuff it was fine it was nice I did it and then I started playing my thing I knew that I was coming and I did this <laughs> and everybody says, what is going on? What happening? Yeah, this is the surprise for you. Ah, I got you. Yeah, so, and then later on, I go to Berkeley, Berkeley in 2010 and 2012. Chucho invited me to perform as a headliner at Carnegie Hall in a series that is called Voices for Latin America. So that also opens the door for me in New York City because New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Downbeat Magazine had the picture of me and Chucho right next to it in a two generation of pianists filling the hall at Carnegie Hall. That was a dream come true 2012 that really you know helped me out to you know to enter New York, the New York scene and so forth. And I called Chucho literally you know we, we you know every birthday how are you? Uh, when I'm on tour, he performing. I invite him to my concert. When I'm on tour, he performing. I go to his, he put me in the guest list. So he's like a, you know, family in a way. You know, you, you growing up in Cuba, you know, Cuba's 90 miles away from, from Florida, mm -hmm. Miami. And um, you guys didn't have the resources to, like here in America, we could turn on WBGO or FM 91 and yeah listen to jazz how were you exposed to some of the elders in, in in black american music this is this is a beautiful question because we the young generation no everyone in cuba you get a cassette and this cassette is going from one hand to the other one forever <laughs> forever and then the way you rewind the cassette is that you actually put like a like a pen and you put it here and you this to the cassette 
if you're lucky enough, they can set that and go flying. <laughs> so, and then, you know, you have the all the, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, Chick Corea, Herbie Hancock, all the Keith Jarrett, uh, Yellow Jacket, you know, Bud Minster, all of uh, the Brecker Brothers, all of that. It's coming from, I got the cassette, oh, chul, listen to this, listen to this, okay, borrow me to it, and then, ah, and forever like that, that's the way we do it. What was the first, <laughs> what was the first jazz musician or first <laughs> jazz album you ever heard? Okay, that was a song that I, well, the first song that I heard, it was Young Step, Kenny Kirland with um, Winter Marsalis, that's a super legendary live concert. Don't remember me somewhere in Europe. I just remember Kenny Killan playing so many notes that I know that the energy was amazing, but I couldn't really pick up anything. And uh, but I knew that uh, that there was something there that I wanted to be part of. That it was so many like of people, of course, you know, and they hear so many stuff and a lot of like a you know quarter of voices here. The funny thing is, like later on, ah, I catch up with you. Later on, when I get to Berkeley, go to music that I was able to be more solid harmonic wise. I was able to revisit that album, and I said, now I can hear note by note, and now I can hear what happening. It's like a, one of the, you know, this this album, and uh, there's an album from uh, Keith Jarrett that is called um, Colon. The album Colon is amazing. The album Return to Forever, Chick Corea, ah, Possibilities, Herbie Hancock. Um, you know, Chick Chick is one of your your musical yeah. heroes, and so <laughs> and so is McCoy Tyner. You know, we we lost both of them during during this COVID-19 pandemic. What, what was it about, for me, what I, I loved about Chick, one, he and I are Geminis. We, we were the same sign. Another thing too, Chick wrote music for different ensembles. He wrote a lot of music. I mean, whether it's Return to Forever, whether it's Gary Burton, the Electric Band, the Trio Band, he wrote so, a yeah. lot of music, yeah. What, what was it for for you as a musician that you keyed in on on his musicianship? I mean, Chick Corea, first of all, is just the energy because I'm coming as well from Gonzalo Rubalcaba as well. Gonzalo Rubalcaba has a lot of Korea inside, and McCoy, uh, you know, uh, Chucho Ade himself, you know. I used to say like, um, when I was growing up, I, I really wanted to be to be in a way different, musical-wise different, and I knew that the only way I can really separate myself from the rest of my friends is it was through here, my writing, my composition, my arrangement, and I knew that that was the only way I can really make a mark on of on really have control of, of what I wanted to express musical-wise. You know, I was a kid, 13, 14 years old. I I already have my band, my my it's called Salsa Blue, and. Um, so I remember that I, through my composition, I was able to say, I'm sad. I'm happy. So that way of having the craft, the ability, the ability to control emotion, through the writing have been one of the biggest things that, that I feel more fortunate to say that I, that I have been working enough about it. You know, they say, they say the, the way you make yourself different, of course to your playing, but uh, it's mostly from your creativity. And if you are sinful enough that I'm not being an improviser, ideas, new ideas, new ideas, new ideas, but you are, you are someone who, you play a melody, you are this is the first step then you have to remember the melody then you have to write that melody now it's the composition otherwise it's just ideas that are coming and new ideas, amazing ideas, but it's like improvisation, I think. So the art of composing is sitting on your instrument, play a, a melody that you like, remember that melody, 
and grind that and grind that grind it down. Wow, wow, that's heavy. But you also went to Berkeley, and I have to ask you, what was it like coming from the classical world that you learned in Cuba, and then coming to one of the most prestigious music institutions in the country, and you're interacting with all of these musicians from all over the world. How was that for your psyche, and how did you, how did you get in sync with what you were getting ready to get into. First of all, I would say that was very humbling. <laughs> I came, I came to Berkeley already with a, an album that was very successful in Cuba. I came to Berkeley already performing with the most famous Cuban timba band, Habana de Primera, Climax, touring the world, literally um, touring with Chucho Valdez, winning Berkeley as a presidential scholarship. And coming to Berkeley with a big ego, like uh, this is like I'm I'm Cubano, I'm in, I'm intouchable. My first, very first semester, because of my you know the audition that you do, they place you in different ensembles. 
So I got the higher rate, which is rating seven. So it was with Greg Hosby. Oh boy. Greg oh Hosby. <laughs> Edmar Colon, 18 years old. I don't know. Uh, Edmar Colon, Greg Hosby, Maestro, and a bunch of amazing cats. Let's say. I remember first class. Let's play all the scene you are. Okay, I can play it. No, but at the first solo is half a step above. <laughs> half a step up. I said, What? Greg Hosby. The next saxophone player, another key. Oh, shoot. The another key, B flat. The another key, C. And I was coming after the guitar player, and I remember that I couldn't come for the guitar because I was so worried that I, my, my round was coming to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I'm not going, I don't know what I'm going to play. And I remember playing just chromatic. He played some weird stuff. Everybody was like, I know you are lost. I said, man, I know, I'm super lost. And then the worst thing is like the best player, Tamir. Tamir, bro, if you remember this, you know, this is, we always laugh about it. He was playing like, video do me like it. He said, listen, my brother, if you know that I'm lost, just play me the freaking root so I know what I am at. <laughs> just play me the roots. Help me out. Don't throw me onto the freaking bus. He was like, I mean, like, <laughs> that was funny. You know, that was so lost. So that was very humbling to be able to say, relax. You are a Latin player, but if you really want to learn American music, American bebop, you gotta rewire yourself and start fresh mm. as a kid. So that was one of the biggest challenge of Berkeley was knowing that I could play, that I can play, but and then, but I knew that I, that I, I didn't, I didn't know that I had so many gaps in my vocabulary as a, as a jazz vocabulary, and I was so called jazz player in Cuba, right? So, but it was nice. I was able to learn from Danilo Perez himself, from Joe Lovano. Uh, I was able to learn from my teacher, amazing teacher, uh, Joan Brakin. I was able to learn from Ray Santisi, rest in peace, Bebop. He has also had like a small hand, you know, he got me a lot of chops for how to, you know, to, to check out a lot of lines with, you know, with chords, with, you know, with small chords and stuff. And, uh, and uh, super simple, it was like an amazing opportunity to be able to, to absorb also with my writing. One of the biggest classes that I got is arranging for four, five, six voices for big band. Bill Frey Horn, Duke Kellington, understanding well the treatment of the of the three trombones. How mm, now? Come to me, I'm ready. Come to me, that I'm ready now. <laughs> By two me ten years, I'm more. What What did Danilo Perez teach you? Danilo, I'm ready to give you a little little backstory about Danilo. One of my very first pace reports was Danilo Perez live when he played at uh, at the Jazz Standard, and he, he has a very, very, very special space in my heart because over the years he's he's really supported me, and um, that man's music to me. He's, he's a he's a phenomenal instructor, and he's a phenomenal person. He's a phenomenal piano player. What 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 is what was your relationship with him like at Berkeley? Yeah, beautiful. He I mean he embraced me. He embraced me very much because you know. Panama and Cuba, culture wise, we are also very similar as well. Uh, one thing is that uh, he told me the he told me no he he confirmed he nurtured me he helped me to continue to believe that the only way you can make a mark in yourself is to be uh, to have the courage to push the boundaries your own boundaries. So and uh, so you see that when he approaches Panamanian Panamanian uh, folklore music. You see that he's really like saying, I'm not going to stay in what you really know. I'm going to try to put out, to stretch it out. So he said, listen, you are a black man from Cuba with all of these different types of, different sounds in front of your plate. You said, this is your time for you to get from here, Benin, Congo, now get some European classical, now get some contra dance, and now get some timba. You know, all of that, you said, that's your only way that you can really make a mark for yourself is because the world always award the one who are very insistent, talented, and very passionate at what they do. I believe that God 
help you God awards the one who are very insistent very talented as well but also very passionate insisting in that I want to make it I want to do it the first album didn't go well the second album the third album this is my way this is my way this is my grand for my my tribute to one for me this is my way of saying look at me the world in some point they will they will acknowledge it. so that's that's Daniel Pérez thing that'll do it again for another dish of the pace of Boy, reporting live here at Chelsea table and stage here in New York City I like to personally thank Dad Ramir Gonzalez for his time. Make sure you support his brand new CD, a tribute to Juan Fromel and Los Van Van, now available on iTunes, Amazon.com, as well as CD Baby. For more information on his upcoming tour dates, please visit him on iTunes, as well as Facebook and Instagram. Also, I'd like to personally thank the staff and management here at Chelsea Table and Stage for their warm hospitality. As always, I can't stress this people more than enough. Please like, share, and subscribe to my videos here on YouTube and Vimeo, as well as leave comments, as well as visit my website, thepacereport.com, for my weekly column, as well as my past segments. Live from Chelsea, table and stage, the Pace Report, live here in New York. Remember, if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Till next time, peace.